Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. By way of introduction, I would want just to call your attention to a verse in Romans that I've mentioned to you before, Romans 1.20 where it says, the invisible things of God are clearly seen in the things that he has made, even his eternal power and Godhead. That is, God put the spiritual truths uh, in all of nature so that somewhere in nature, everything we look at speaks of some spiritual truth. God just didn't create a mass of something and let it go and say, but it all had meaning. So that everything he created uh, had meaning, spiritual truths. Uh, that's, uh, there's spiritual truths like in the sun, the moon, the stars, all of the animals. For instance, Jesus said of Herod, that fox and the disciples be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And in the Christians he likened unto sheep. And in the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter there, uh, remember when John was caught up to heaven? And there could be no one found to open the seals, the seven, the book that was in the hands of God. And uh, finally, one of the elders said, John, don't weep. He was weeping. He said, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah will open the seals. And then he looked and saw a lamb. I want you to see all of these in Ezekiel. We have the picture of the uh, creatures with the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle. And the scholars feel like those four represented the face of Jesus. So uh, this morning I want to pick out the little donkey and look at him. That's what Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And I want us to look at this little fella this morning. I want to, if you have your Bibles, I want to just read in the Mark, the 11th chapter, and starting with the first verse. Or starting rather with the second verse, the first verse, just simply they were coming near Jerusalem and Jesus sent two of his disciples on, starting the second verse, it says, and he saith unto them, that is the two disciples he sent on the way, he said, go your way into the village over against you and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied. That's a little donkey. Whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. <clears throat> I'm coming more and more to appreciate the words the Holy Spirit uses. He doesn't waste words, and they're important. If any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. When they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto him, What do ye loosing the coal? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strawed them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. There was a prophecy of this in Zechariah, uh, the ninth chapter, I believe. It says that your king shall come riding on a uh, colt. Here it is. I've got to just read it in the ninth chapter in the ninth verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. He's coming lowly. But he's conquering. He's, he's not losing anything. That makes me think of that little booklet that Esther Morey has written 
Uh, the lion conquers, not the lion. Beautiful little thing. It ought to be in every home of every parent that have children. And I understand now it's even being uh, taken to China and translated there, just two dollars for a little thing. Oh, it's, it's tremendous. The, the, the lamb conquers, not the lamb. Here the colt conquers, not, not, not the horse. So, uh, as we look at this, it's interesting on this day that Jesus should come in such a way and proclaiming himself to be king because before he hid himself. And often he would say, now don't tell anybody. And when he fed the 5,000, they wanted to make him king and he slipped away and went to the mountain to pray and now he's declaring himself king. He's doing the opposite of what he's done through his life. And now he's openly declaring himself to be a king and he's riding into Jerusalem as a king. My, what a difference between a Roman procession would be. A Roman emperor would come riding on a horse with great pomp and show. Now I know that the scholars tell us that the kings come, uh, when they come on a donkey, I mean on a yeah, donkey, they're coming in peace. But I want you to know Jesus wasn't coming in peace. He came to bring a sword. And he's writing, on, he's writing the opposite of what a Roman emperor be. G. Campbell Morgan says, this procession was a procession of poverty. Scattering of clothes, poor people taking off their clothes and laying it in the way and branches tearing them off the trees. That's the best they could offer here to Jesus. And so these broken branches and the shouting of a Galilean mob. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey divested of all things that humanity had for so long associated with kingship. He was divested of everything. But he's coming as a king. As G. K. O. Morgan says, it was a pageant of poverty. Now, I know that many say that, as I said, the king rode on a donkey when coming in peace. But I want you to know that Jesus, as I said, was not coming in peace. He was coming with a sword. He came to divide. And uh, so what he did, he actually, it was almost like declaring war. What he did was, was confronting even the Roman government. And what he did was considered high treason by Rome. For any man to come in a crowd and declare himself a king was high treason. This is what this what he is not somebody meek and lowly. This is a man defying the Roman Empire. Not only that, uh, so that's why the Pharisees tried to get Jesus to quiet the crowd down. Because Rome was apt to be stirred up and come and, and, uh, and come in with their armies and take away all the power that uh, Israel did have at that time. He declared war on the religious leaders. He then went into the temple and overturned the money changers and uh, the, uh, drove out the oxen and, and wouldn't let anybody uh, carry any merchandise through the thing. I want you to know he's not coming in meekness and peace here. He's coming as a king conquering uh, on a, and he's riding on a donkey. Yes. So, I want you to know that it didn't take a horse to make Jesus a king. It would have had added absolutely, it would have added absolutely nothing to Jesus had you put him on a horse. Neither did the donkey detract from his kingship. A horse would only have been a distraction. Can you imagine Jesus prancing on a nice, beautiful, high-spirited prancing horse? What had happened? The horse lovers that had noticed the horse. They'd have admired the horse and said, what a beautiful creature he's riding. Look at that horse. They didn't do that with a donkey. Nobody admired the donkey. So Jesus rode in on a donkey. 
No one ever built a monument to a donkey. Now they have two horses, but they never have to a donkey. A donkey is just a beast of burden. And he rode on a donkey, it says, that never man sat on. Doesn't he do un unusual things? Now I want to tell you, nobody else better try to do that. But a never man sat on, an untrained donkey, and Jesus didn't need any donkey that had been trained by anybody else for him to ride on it. The Holy Spirit does not mince words. So the important thing about this donkey is not the animal, but the one riding on it. It didn't make any difference what he was riding. The, the donkey wasn't important, and so he rides on something that isn't important. He's the one that's important. And as I said, it didn't take a horse to add anything to Jesus. Now, why is it that Jesus rode a donkey? Well, first of all, I want you to know that a donkey is a type of man. We have that picture over in the book of Exodus, the 13th chapter and the 13th verse. We find that Jesus, it says here, and the firstling, or every firstling of an ass, thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among men shalt thou redeem. You had to redeem a man and a donkey. You didn't redeem a horse, but you had to redeem a donkey because the man and the donkey were linked together. So a donkey is a type of man. Now that includes the women because in the Bible, male and female are included in the word man. So the donkey that Jesus used was a type of Jesus riding to victory on a man. I want you to get this. A man that had been tamed by Jesus. A man that is tamed, he still rides to victory as a king. Oh, dear ones, Jesus is not looking for a proud, prancing horse. He's looking for a donkey. I, some of you may have heard on Dr. Seward's program here a few, uh, I don't know, Sundays ago or something. I heard part of it. I like to watch sometimes the interviews that he has. And he interviewed a man for, that was, some of you probably maybe saw it. He interviewed a man that came from a little country between India and China. And they were headhunters. And this man that Dr. Sewell was in, his grandfather was a headhunter. And that country, they were considered some of the worst headhunters in the world. And, uh, but a missionary came there uh, around 19, I don't remember the date, 19, 1910, something like that came into that, that head-hunting country, preached for five days, and left the Gospel of John. And this man that was being interviewed by Dr. Sewer, his grandfather was converted. And uh, now I think he said that 85% of the people of that country are converted. Why? God found a donkey to ride on. A donkey rode into that little country. Who remembers the donkey? But he found a donkey to ride on into that little country. And now those headhunters, and he had also on the program a, a group of little children. They were singing, beautiful little children had been saved and singing for Jesus because God found a donkey to ride on. So, and, and, and this, it, it's amazing what God is. I love in verse, 1 Corinthians in the first chapter where it says, Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. 
And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the things that are despised hath God has chosen that no, no flesh should glory in his presence. Look at the finest men of all over the world, the great men, everything, that no flesh should glory in his presence. They're donkeys. Oh, if we could get a hold of that. It says this donkey was tied in a place where two ways met. But I like what it says. They sent and said, tell them that Jesus has need of this donkey. <laughs> if you qualify to be a donkey, Jesus needs you. He doesn't need you if you're a prancing horse. But if you're willing to be a donkey, he needs you. And this one had never been trained or tamed, a wild uh, young donkey. And Jesus said, bring that one to me. I'll ride him. That encourages my heart, the wildest young fellow that you can think of, get him to Jesus, he'll tame him. And Jesus can ride him. Jesus knows how to tame him. I want to tell you that donkey became tamed. But here's the cold tide in a place where two ways met and how many young people are standing away. Choices to go one way or another. Making choices. Which way do you want to go? And Jesus said, bring him to me. Or you can let him go and he can choose his own way and, and go out into the world and, and make a downward path. But Jesus says he's at the place where choices are made. What kind of a choice? You young people that are here today, what kind of a choice are you going to make? So Jesus said, bring him to me. And he sat upon him. I'll tell you, when Jesus can get a hold of a young man, it's amazing what he can do with him. So, I want you to know if you make a choice for Jesus, the world will not build a monument for you, and they'll not praise you, but God will take notice. Anybody want to volunteer to be a donkey for Jesus to ride? They'll not build you a monument. But heaven will take notice. And I'll tell you, someday entering into the glory, he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You carried my son into that little mission country. Jesus rode in every country you can think of. Jesus found a donkey to ride into India, into China, into Japan. Wherever he went, he found a donkey to ride. Not a horse, but a donkey. And he conquered. This donkey was a conquering donkey. The important thing is Jesus, the one who rides is the one who's important. And if you can surrender to Jesus, then whatever he does through you, I love that he didn't choose the wise and rejected or, or not many. I'm glad like some noble woman, was it? I forget now what country, Russia or something. She said, I was saved by an M. He didn't say not any, he said not many. And she said, I got in on that. God saved her, not many. That ought to encourage everyone. Not many wise, not many noble, not many great, not many strong. That's what God's chosen. That should let everybody qualify. You say, well, I just don't, can't qualify to do anything. Brother, if you can get into that group, you qualify. I remember I was preaching one time in one church. I went to the Lord if I prayed. I was on the path of the Lord. How in the world did I ever get here? And so that verse came to me right away. God had chosen the weak and the spine. I said, that's all right, Lord, I qualify. God can get us in places that we never dreamed we could get into. He does it. He's the Lord and master of the universe. All he wants is a donkey who will let him ride. And I tell you, that donkey was submissive to Jesus. And that's what God wants. And if he can get a hold of a life, you can, Jesus will ride you into places that you never dreamed of. And I think almost everyone that God ever uses, they'll, they'll marvel that God ever got them there because they were willing to be a donkey 
for Jesus to ride. So on this Palm Sunday, this triumphant day, I marvel at this little creature, and I'm trusting that God will help us to be a willing donkey for Jesus the Savior to ride.